All right, g'day, my name is Brendan. The second talk this week. Yesterday I talked about eBPF, which is Advanced Analysis in Linux. And today I'm talking about using Puff Events. In some ways, eBPF is what we are beginning to use at Netflix and what we'll be using in the future to solve some things. Whereas Puff is what we have been using for many years. And this is a summary of the sort of things that we've found and the sort of gotchas and workarounds that we've had to employ. I'll start with a case study, and that is ZFS, a, some staff on the Netflix cloud for a microservice said that ZFS on their instances was eating a lot of CPU. Now, as a performance engineer, I get asked lots of different issues and lots of strange things. This is, this is one issue where it was surprising, and it's one where I assumed that they were mistaken. I worked on ZFS at Sun, and I'm very familiar with the code paths, and the way we configure it at Netflix, ZFS on Linux, there's no way ZFS can eat 30% of CPU. We have some trouble with uh, the mic. Okay, so I should switch? Yeah. Right, switching audio. Here we go. Slides there. I don't have control of that. No, you, you just have to force the switch on the screen. Sometimes. No, I don't. You don't have. No, no. There we go. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, testing this microphone, all right. So I'll start again. This is where a, some staff on the Netflix cloud who were looking after a microservice had said that EFS was eating 30% of the CPU on their system. And I thought that this was unusual and surprising and probably unlikely, as ZFS can't eat that much CPU. We also configure it in such a way that there should not be a scenario where it's eating noticeable CPU. As a performance engineer, I don't want to tell the customer they're just wrong. I do want to show that I have investigated and I've double-checked because many times I've been surprised at what I've found. So I created a flame graph, and we have this automated at Netflix where you go to a self-service tool called Vector, which we've open-sourced, and you can look at real-time metrics on an instance. You can then click a button to get a CPU flame graph, and then behind the scenes, it will go and run perf events, and it just has some shell scripts to automate it, and then we'll generate a flame graph that we can look at. I was expecting the flame graph to look like something on the right. So I'll go through flame graphs in detail in this talk and how they work, but the color palette I'm using there is green for Java, yellow for C++, and red for C. And the x-axis is the population, and the y-axis is, is the stack depth. Hands up if you've used flame graphs already. Okay, so we have a quarter of the people. All right. Just the high-level picture here is that it's mostly green, and that's what a lot of our microservices look like. We're mostly green on CPU, which means we're, we're spending most of our time in Java. And so that's, say, 97% of user time, it's Java. That's what I expected. So when someone's saying, their instance is spending 30% of CPU time in ZFS. That's going to be kernel time, and that's not really what I expected. So I generate the flame graph, and the flame, gra flame graph looks like this. In fact, I've got it. I'll just show it. On the left and right are these towers that are colored orange. And they're colored orange because that's kernel time. And in the middle, I have the, this is the Netflix code, which is Java colored in green, and I've got the rest of the JVM. And I can mouse over these areas and say, well, this tower is 9% on CPU, and this tower over here is 29% on CPU. And if I have a look inside it, this is shrink zone, SPL, this is ZFS. And this is ZFS, this is Arc Reclaim. I know this code. So the customer was, was right, we are actually spending in total, if I add 9% over to 26%, I'm over 
30% of the CPU time really is in ZFS. So good thing that I checked and that we've automated it. And even though you may have an assumption about what CPU is doing, it's very frequent that you, if it's so easy to create a flame graph or create a profile and have a look, you can just confirm things. So too often I've had people say they don't want to look at a profile because they know what it's going to look like. And I've been surprised so much in this line of work that it's, you want to make it automated, you want to make it quick and double check. So it turns out they were right. We were spending over 30 percent of time in ZFS. But having a look at the code paths, this is ARC adjust. So ZFS has the adaptive replacement cache for doing the, its main memory file system cache. If it's doing ARC adjust so much, it means it's shrinking the ARC. And it will do that because the system is running out of memory and it needs to keep a threshold free for applications to use. And thinking about this at Netflix, it's like, why would we spend so much time in ARC adjust? It's like, oh, well, we do have some container microservices. And on the container microservices, they create and destroy containers. And as part of destroying containers, you're destroying the ZFS data sets. As part of destroying them, it will free up the memory. And it's, this is freeing up memory. And so thinking about it, I'm starting to paint a picture and a theory. OK, this does make sense. You're on a container host. You're destroying containers, you're freeing memory, that's why you're spending so much time in ZFS. And I tell the customer this, I've analyzed it, I've solved it, there's the problem, it's normal. We should optimize it because it seems to be a lot of time and I bet I know how to optimize it by adjusting the ZFS record size to be something smaller, but that's the explanation. And then they said the next thing that was surprising to me, which was, we don't even use ZFS. <laughs> it's like, Yes, you do use ZFS. I can see that you're using ZFS. It's over 30% of the CPU time is in ZFS. File systems don't just eat CPU because they want to eat CPU. They don't just do that. Kernel code doesn't just run because it feels like it wants to run. You are definitely using ZFS. I'm telling you, you're using ZFS. And they said, nope, we haven't used it. We're not using it at all. It's like, no, this can't be the case. So I run mount. There's no ZFS mounted file systems. Have a look around. There's no ZFS. It's like, no, this can't be true. Oh. But going back to my theory, well, they're creating and destroying containers, and I'm seeing it after the fact. So even though I can have a look and there's no ZFS right now, it's because it happened in the past. And that's why I can't see it right now. Because I know they're using ZFS. I can see these towers. So just to double check, I remembered that there are some other kernel counters, which I can dig out of proc, which are the arc stats. And just to prove to them that they have used ZFS, I'll do things like, I'll show you your summary since boot of arc hits and arc misses. So I bring it up, and the summary since <laughs> And I'm very familiar with those counters, and it means they're telling the truth. They really haven't ever used ZFS. So they've booted a system, and it's spending 30, over 30% of CPU time in ZFS, which they're not even using. It's like, okay, I've never seen this before. This is very strange. And so with the flame graph, I can just drill in and start to have a look at this. And so now I'm looking with, with flame graphs, you can zoom. It's very easy, very nice. So I'm zooming into the ZFS paths, and I see we're in arc reclaim thread, arc adjust, multi-list get random index. That's a new function that was added after my time. Spa get random. Entropy? <laughs> and it turns out we're spending all this time in entropy. Extract entropy. Like, that's, that's a lot of time in entropy over here. And if I go over here, we find out we're getting blocked on locks. The other code path is holding. So here we are waiting on a conditional variable. And we're trying to do the KMM cache reap now. So it's the same stuff. Entropy. So I have a look at the code path. And it turns out there was a recent change that I didn't know about in ZFS where there are multiple lists in the arc for containing memory. And if you need to free some memory from one of those lists, how do you pick a list? Round robin? No, let's pick a list at random. But make sure we pick a list at some secure level of randomness. So the arc actually has no buffers in memory. All the lists are zero. But it's spending a whole lot of CPU time making sure it's picking one of those zero-length lists to free, and then later finds out it's zero. So this, was, this is one of the craziest bugs I've ever encountered. 
And it was a change to ZFS to imp imp it added this multi-list feature where the R could be split up into lists, which would help performance because CPUs can be working on separate lists. But the way the free code path worked by trying to use the, the wrong random function, uh, random with entropy, meant we ended up wasting a lot of CPU time in this. So that's a quick, quick case study on flame graphs and shows that, I, that, as is the case, this industry can be very surprising. I work at Netflix, I mentioned that yesterday, and I'm going to go through Perf and how we use it. The first topic is why does Netflix need CPU profiling? It's so that we can understand CPU usage quickly and completely. It sounds pretty basic, but there are many profilers that don't do this. How we use it is we have an open source tool, Netflix Vector. It's a self-service UI. You click a button, you can get flame graphs, heat maps, and various other reports out of it. I've been adding reports to this recently for BPF. Completely means I want to see everything. I don't want to just see application code. I want to see kernel code, C, C++, everything. Everything that's a CPU consumer. So there's very little that doesn't show up here. There's a couple of small things, but I want to see all of it. And this is important because if you look at some application level profilers, like especially with Java, which we use a lot, they work through the JVM TI interface and they'll only show you Java time. They won't show you when you're in the kernel. But like with the ZFS instance, the kernel can eat a lot of CPU. We use Linux perf because it's on, all, all, on our instances, we've got Linux. It's low overhead, it's been optimized for this. It's accurate, so it can see everything. And also, Java and application-level profilers, which are popular, they don't really know what's running on CPU. Whereas the, having an asynchronous, interrupt-driven profiler, the kernel knows the truth. The kernel knows if your thread is running or not. And so sometimes you can use a Java profiler and it tells you paths are running when they're really not. And so if you look up Java and EPOL, you'll see lots of Stack Overflow, p people complaining about how EPOL is burning a lot of CPU, which may be the case, but often it's because of the way J the JVMTI profiler is not working correctly. No blind spots, we can see everything, and some of the application profilers actually have sample skew, so they can't just sample, Java, the JVMTI profiler has to wait for a safety point. It can't just take a stack trace whenever it feels like. <laughs> Whereas if you use the kernel asynchronous profiler, you just take a stack trace when you want, and that gives you a more accurate profile. It's really important to Netflix because we have many tens of thousands of instances, and we scale up and down each day based on a scaling rule, and that scaling rule is usually CPU-based. So something quite often we use is 60% CPU. So a microservice tracks 60% CPU utilization. If that utilization goes up, we add more instances. And that gives us headroom for doing things like failover, region failover. Now, we can scale up quickly, which means if, if we can find a small performance win, a 1% win, and we have tens of thousands of instances, we can scale down within the hour. In fact, AWS just changed pricing to be per second. We can scale down within the hour and immediately have price savings. So it's a great environment to work in if you're a performance engineer because all the small wins you can find, as soon as you deploy it in production, you're getting that, that gain. You're saving the company money. We use CPU pro profiling for lots of things. It's saving money by reducing the footprint on the cloud. It's also to, there might be regressions such as in latency for new software versions and CPU footprint, instance response, evaluating third-party software, and so on. Perf does a lot of things, but we actually spend about 95% of, I, I feel like I spend about 95% of my time looking at CPU profiles and 5% on everything else. With Netflix, we have a culture of freedom and responsibility, and engineers are free to change production code quickly, and also engineering velocity. And each week, there'll be several major production pushes of code, every single week. And when you're changing the code so much, there's, there's frequently CPU regressions. And so there's a new code path. It's not as optimized as the previous software version. We need to identify that quickly. 
Also, when we're pushing several major changes a week, we need to be able to profile quickly. If it takes us a few days to generate a profile and understand it, the software has changed in the last few days. That's why we need to be able to just click a button and then get a flame graph in a minute. CPU profiling should be easy, so this should be a nice, easy talk, but there are a lot of gotchas with it, which is what makes this talk more interesting, which I'll get through. Some basics on perf. Perf, which is impossible to Google, which is why I will sometimes use perf events, and other people will sometimes use perf events so that we can find it. It's the official Linux profiler. It has a Ponycore mascot, just like ftrace does, and so does BPF and many others. It supports many profiling and tracing features. So you can use, perfect came from CP performance counters, PMCs, but since then, lots of things have been added. So it can access K probes, trace points, U probes, and every kernel version, if you look at the perf editions, there's a lot. It's really hard to keep on top of perf. It's changing quickly. And some, some more interesting things, different ways of doing stack tracing. I guess now we've got the orc stacks that we need to deal with as well and so on. There have been some bugs in the past. For us, the experience with perf has been good. It's been stable. If you run perf at the command line, it will list out the multi-commands, the sub-commands. I've highlighted the ones I generally use all the time, so list, listing events, record, report. A basic workflow, if I was to use perf to figure something out, is I would list to find events, stat to count them, record, report, and then script. In fact, I'll, let me just do this. So I've got stuff on this. I did have perf on this instance. So this is how you install perf. If this happens to you, what you need to do this is what I get for upgrading the kernel so I can make sure that I'm demonstrating what I want. Uh, so perf has been compiled for a particular kernel version because it needs to match the AB ABI. So perf, there's the subcommands on this kernel version. Perf list, you list out various things. So my workflow is I'll start by looking for things I want. So I may be on context switches or particular events. I can run perf stat just to get an idea of the rate of an event. And I can give it a dummy command, so here's one test. So there are 50 context switches in one second. This is a, a little chart. My Mercedes was changed recently, so it's now just a text message. So the command is an E for the event, A for all CPUs. I put a dummy command at the end. Once I've found the event that's interesting, now this use of perf is great because it's efficient. Because you just can move forward and back and back to the same thing. So I might trace something that was way. It was much more expensive. So here I've done, done a perf stat minus E of the scheduler events. And I can look at the frequency of events. I oh, printed out the total runtime. I can look at the frequency of events and figure out, I can look at the frequency of events and figure out if something is too expensive to, to trace going forward. So once I've found an event, I then might want to do perf record. That's just told me, so what perf stand is doing in kernel counts, perf record will dump it to the file system, and that has only recorded eight samples. What it does is it will populate ring buffer, it will wake up dynamically and asynchronously so that it minimizes the number of times perf needs to wake up and write things out. It only woke up one time to write, one time to write data, which is good.
And so it's written a perf.data file. I can run perf script and look at events one by one. Or I can use perf report. And look at events there summarized in a different way. Usually I'm doing stack traces as well, so. So now I've done a, I've added a minus G for call graphs, stack traces, and then I can see the perf report or perf script summary with the stack traces. So basic work, workflow, find an event, count it, see how frequent it is. If it's not too frequent, record it. If it's too frequent, then figure out something else, like use eBPF. Record it, then I can report it, I can script it, I can get a raw event dump and then deal with it there. I've got a slide here, again, these slides will be online where I go through something for, for scheduler events. The stat record format is the action, an event, scope, and then options like call graphs. Different actions. So stat counts them, record does them, you know, record will write it out. Record does, lots, uh, does record lots of information, so it has a, I can do a, a perf script minus cap D to get the debug information out. And it's got timestamps, CPUs, process IDs, lots of things to post process. Uh, and I can, there's also perf top, which is something to look at events in real time. Different events, so I just did context switches for a software event, but I can also use Custom timers, PMCs, trace points, and dynamic tracing. I've drawn a map here to show where, where they're all, what they all measure. I, I showed this yesterday with BPF and the different kernel versions that BPF supported these features. But you can see the role of them. So PMCs let me look at low-level CPU activity. I've got trace points. There's collections of trace points like syscalls, shared task signal to look at various locations in the kernel. U-probes and K-probes for dynamic tracing of user space and kernel space. Kernel space. Perf list to list them out. There's a lot of different ways to do scope, just so that you're aware of this. So apart from all CPUs, I can look at a process ID. I can also, I can match user and kernel only. I can also do C groups. So I've been using this a lot recently to, for doing container analysis. So in the host, I can say perf record minus, minus minus C group and then docker slash UUID and it will only record those events. I have a web page full of perf one liners. Has anyone used my perf one liners web page? So a few people. It's, it's a, there's a lot. So I've got a few in the slides, but I'm not sure they do it justice. It's a quick way to understand the capabilities of perf. So and I, and I iterate through different things, like doing PMC analysis, doing perf stat of trace points, perf record of, say, samples, trace points, PMCs, uh, different ways of doing perf report. Just to show you how long that is. know where this is. Performance metrics. Perf examples. Yeah, maybe that's a bit slow. All right. So lots. I have lots and lots of one lines where I iterate through them. Uh, because there's so much functionality in Perf, I tend to forget what it can do. I want to summarize CPU profiling quickly, but this should be straightforward where CPU profiling, the word profiling can actually mean different things. So some people think profiling means tracing or where you're instrumenting function calls. And it can, like, it's, it's, it, it can mean different things. We tend to, when we're talking about profiling in systems performance engineering, we mean sampling. We're sampling events, which is good because it has low overhead. I might be sampling at 99 hertz on all CPUs. Uh, disadvantages, it can have coarse accuracy, but it's usually sufficient. 
If I took 99 hertz samples for 30, 30 seconds, I'll end up with quite a lot of samples. I can output them using perf re re report. So I've got perf record here to sample and then perf report to print it out. A problem with sampling stack traces is you can get a lot of output. Here's the output of a profile of perf report, and right in the top left you can see the beginning of the command, and there must be hundreds and hundreds of pages of output. As a performance engineer, this, this makes it challenging to understand. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes you run perf report, and if you look at the percentages you see, most of what you need to understand is in the top stack because you have one busy stack and that's it. But sometimes you have to dig through it all, and that's why this can be more useful as a flame graph. And so that's a flame graph of the same data set where this is actually an adjacency diagram using a hierarchical layout. And, and I can see the stack trace going from bottom up. And the, so, so the y-axis is the stack depth and the x-axis of a flame graph is the, the population of samples. So I came up with flame graphs a while ago when I was uh, investigating MySQL performance and I needed to understand two different systems very, very quickly. And digging through the profiler output was just too much text. And I was printing it out and marking it up in red pen. And it's like, I'll never get this done by Friday. I need, to, I need to, a better visualization so that I can understand all this profiler output. And I played with some visualizations for performance tracing before, and, and someone at Sun had done this uh, passage of time visualization. So each rectangle shows w when you enter and exit functions. And, but my data set didn't have function entry and exits. I didn't have timestamps for entry and exit. I just had samples. And so I thought, what if I took that visualization type, but instead of having the passage of time on the x-axis, I just merged my I just threw out the passage of time. So I don't, don't care about the passage of time. I just want to visualize the, the profile I have, all those samples. And so what I did was I, I put all my samples out and then I sorted them to be in alphabetical order from the bottom frame to the top frame. And that put the same frames next to each other so I could merge them. And that's where the flame graph comes from. So if, if you can imagine, a flame graph is really, say, a thousand very thin columns, which is each of the samples, and I place them in such a way to maximize merging, and if you have an, a, a thin column next to another one, I, I get to make that frame bigger. It has an advantage in that if a, if a frame is really thin, so this tiny, so one of these tiny thin frames may only be 0.1% of the profile, it becomes so thin I can't write the function name on the flame graph. There's not enough pixels, which is a good thing because the, the frames that are the largest are the ones we care about the most. And so you just visually look at this and you look for the biggest bulk of the, the where the largest tower is, and that's the bulk of the samples. So if I looked at this and saw main, read a loop, exec command, that's probably 80% of the CPU is there. And then I get down into the weeds as Bash runs different things. The color for flame graphs, I originally picked a warm palette and I just randomized the frames so that you could differentiate between two towers that were next to each other. So colors don't mean a lot. I sometimes use the hues for doing, say, Java is green and C++ is yellow. So generating them, flame graphs for a long time have been just this Perl program I wrote a, a while ago. Uh, it's on GitHub and it, it can eat the output of perf script. So I run perf script into stack collapse and then feed that into flame graph. We've been working on a new version at Netflix in D3, and so we're open sourcing that as well. And D3 will give us more interactivity. Flame graphs have various options. So you can set different palettes, which I mentioned. I've drawn up a workflow of using, of creating flame graphs like this. So perf list, perf stat, perf record, and then we end up, uh, perf script we can feed into stack collapse and then it generates the flame graph. 
That's how it used to be on Linux 2.6, but on 4.5, perf report uh, minus G folded. So perf report, I think uh, Mizami added this so that it can then emit a summarized format directly. And then I just need a little bit of awk to turn it into a flame graph. Or if you're on Linux 4.9, just to show them all side by side, I can use BPF and I can sample stacks in kernel context and just feed them into a flame graph directly. And uh, the other basics about flame graphs I think are obvious. So I've got, if you mouse over something, it will tell you the percent. You can click areas to zoom. And Adrian, who's here, did that code, Adrian Methics. Thanks for that. Added the zoom code a while ago, which has been like one of the best features of flame graphs. Uh, and the other interactive feature that's important is search. So, so if, I, if I do control F, I can search. So I search for KMM and it's matched it there. Uh, let me. So they have search for Java and it's matched it everywhere. Uh, the useful thing about search is on the bottom right, I print the how many samples that match that search term for. So if you had a lot of code paths that were ending up in, say, mutex contention, and I wanted to add them all up, you don't need to visually like hop around for half an hour mentally adding them up. You can just search for it, and then it says 58.7% of all code paths had that search term. So it's very quick for, for, for doing that type of analysis. So gotchas. So when we've tried to use perf, lots of things don't work. If you try this yourself and you haven't done it before, you need to get stack walking to work on your application, then get simple translation to work, then get IPC to work from PMCs, and at that point, perf probably works on your system. To explain the problems we've hit, so stack traces don't work they look like this, where you've just got a single bogus address instead of what should be a nice stack trace. This is also valid. So I've just got these single addresses when I should have a, a full stack trace. I'm not talking about whether symbols work or not. This is just whether stack traces work. If you turn this into a flame graph, it looks like this. So I've got broken stack traces for Java. It's just this, this grass that doesn't work. Fixing them. It's either you can do frame pointer based stack walking, you can get that to work, or you can use a different type of stack walking. Stack walking. The big problem here is that by default, perf uses frame pointer based stack walking. And many runtime, well, GCC, by def many builds from GCC will use the, uh, the emit frame pointer optimization. So you can use the frame pointer register, like percent RBP on x86 64 as a general purpose register. And it, nowadays, it doesn't matter so much. Nowadays, it doesn't make code that much faster. Like, it may be, it may be so hard, it may be less than 1% faster to use that extra register. It depends on your code, but quite often it's almost negligible. Uh, but the problem is, as a performance analyst, I don't have stack traces now. I can't do frame pointer based stack walks if the, if the frame point is no longer available, we've reused that register. So try to get a stack walking technique to work that perf will support. So I, I worked on, oh yeah, I've got a slide, so I mentioned GCC has the minus F no emit frame pointer, if you've ever had to recompile using that. I worked with Java and did preserve frame pointer. So I coded this up originally and then Oracle rewrote it and merged it so that you can now do minus XX plus preserve frame pointer on Java, so that Java will keep the frame pointer for methods, which is great. So to show how that fixed things, this is what broken Java stacks used to look like, and this is what they look like after you fixed it. So now I have a full stack, which is much better. That's what it looks like in a flame graph, that's much better. I don't have symbols, but at least I've fixed one problem. And the same is true for any runtime. So just try it on your runtime. If stacks, if you see full stacks, even if it's hex, at least stack trace it, stack walking works. 
if you, if you just see these single frame things, you probably need to fix stack walking to start with. So the next thing is how do you fix the symbols once you've fixed the stacks? It depends on the runtime. So for Java and Node.js, it differs. There's generally a way you can get the runtime to dump a symbol table. And perf for a long time has supported these supplemental symbol maps in slash temp perf dash pid dot map. And so we use an on-demand Java, uh, Java agent that will, perf map agent that will dump out a map that perf will use. Uh, and there's also ones for node.js as well. So this is, it's on GitHub, it's perf map agent. And so once you get that to work, you then get, so here I've got flame graph with my Java palette. You can then see the Java methods. This is really great because you get to see, here I'm in C, I'm then going into the JVM in C++. Now I'm going into methods, and then we're doing a write in, in Java, and then we're going into libp thread. Now we're back into the kernel. So you can see the full path. This is a multi-mode stack trace. If you try this, you'll discover something interesting, and that is that the stack traces you're looking at are incomplete because Java inlines a lot of things. If you use a JVM TI profiler, you'll see the full stack trace, but perf is only looking at what's actually running on CPU after inlining. And so you can do things like tuning, inlining, but perf map agent has a way to uninline the frames so that you can do a full flame graph. Perf has ways to do this as well. So perf has perf basic prof and perf basic prof only functions for dumping the supplemental symbol files. Instruction profiling is another gotcha. And as an example, here's 16 knobs in a loop. Imagine if I profiled this, what would the profile look like? Would I have an even distribution for the instructions? So that's, that's it. So I've got a push and a mov and then lots of knobs and then a jump. I would have guessed it would have been D because like the push and the mov would be more expensive and there's my cheap knobs and there's a jump. It actually looks like this. So I don't even see many of these knobs and that's for a number of reasons. So CPUs run things out of order and in parallel and when you're sampling the instruction pointer, you're sampling the resumption instruction, not what's, not the micro op that's currently running. Unless you're trying to, unless you go and use an advanced feature. So Intel has PEBS for pre precise event-based sampling. And not only do you have the problem of, of sampling the resumption instruction, because CPUs will take in, say it's a four wide processor, it'll bring in four instructions, run them all in parallel and out of order. And so what is the instruction pointer point to when you're actually executing four at the same time. It can't point to all four. <laughs> it has to point to one of them, which is why you see all these skips. So that's one problem, and the other problem is skid. When the interrupt comes in, when does it actually pick up the stack trace? So PEBS is, would help with that. And PERF supports PEBS. Another gotcha is VM guests. If you try running PERF inside a virtual machine guest, it may say not supported for a lot of the PMCs. And I wanted to mention in the slide, this is fixable. And Zen has supported PMCs for a long time. People just don't turn it on. Uh, I worked on a, a, a sort of a firewall for Zen PMC so that you could only enable a subset, so the Intel architectural set. And that was recently enabled in EC2, Amazon EC2 for the largest instance types. So if you're in a virtual machine, there, there are ways to get access to PMCs. You just need to work with a hypervisor. Many virtual machines have MSRs, so model-specific registers, which can give you interesting information as well. So there's one of my tools for looking at, say, uh, Turbo Boost. And also I wanted to mention here that virtual machines, there's another problem with PEBS. So even if you can access PMCs, PEBS is something else. So is last branch record and BTS and processor trace. So if you live in the world of virtual machines, you have to go, go and do a bunch of work to get all of, all of these enabled. Containers is another big gotcha. And of course, we use containers a lot at Netflix. Yes.
as the mic's being assembled. So in the context of EC2, if you are looking at the, of, as those very low level CPU information, you are not getting only your impact on the system, but also the noisy neighbors. So in the context of Netflix, what is the interest of understanding what is really running on the CPU, while maybe someone else than you is running on the same host? Sure, so if you're looking at PMCs, uh, since I'm on EC2, wouldn't I be seeing activity from neighbors? The way the hypervisor works is on context switch, it will save the PMC registers and then populate the next set and then run that guest. And so for a lot of the PMCs, uh, you're only looking at your activity. And this is the same as when you run perf minus p on a process, the way it will uh, stash away and then uh, bring back the, the PMC set each time you context switch around. And it's not different from hypervisors. Where you might see activity from other guests might be uh, if, you, if you say digging into a shared cache. So the last level cache hits and misses, and then you notice that your uh, hit rate goes down a bit and you can't explain it, and it's because other people are consuming that cache. Now if you worry too much about that being an information leak, but the, you, could, you could figure this out anyway. You could just do micro-benchmarking of like cache access and say, sometimes my micro-benchmark is a bit slower because there's another guest using the shared LLC cache. And that's why Intel did, Intel, well, that's one of the reasons Intel did Intel CAT for cache allocation technology, so we can partition up the hardware caches. So I think most of the time the PMCs don't show other guests because of the context switch. Sometimes, sort of, because it's a shared resource and you can see that there's more contention. Uh, but I wouldn't get too excited because, like, we, I mean, I can just micro-benchmark it and figure that out anyway and figure out that there's contention for a resource. So containers are another gotcha, and uh, you need, just need to work with it. So if perf is trying to find symbol files in temp, temp is somewhere else because it's a different namespace, and um, Alice did a blog post. This should be fixed in 4.14 because there was a new patch set so that perf would look up other namespaces, which is really good. And the last gotcha is overhead. And whenever you use perf, you just need to be aware of the rate of events. And that's why I did a perf stat to start with. So you can see the rate of events before you instrument them. I'll mention some advanced things quickly. That's everything I just talked about was gotchas and profiling, which turns out to be a big topic because there's a lot of uh, kinks to it. But of course, Perf can do trace points, so I can record, say, block events. And in the slides, I've got how you can understand the format string, where that comes from. Uh, I've got lots of one-liners for static tracing and dynamic tracing and advanced dynamic tracing. So Perf can do things like uh, walk. If you have debug info, you can walk through kernel structs and dig things out. And if you don't have debug info on an instance, which is often the case for me, you can run perf probe minus nv with your instrumentation. It then says, this is what I would have done. And then you can copy and paste that onto a system that doesn't have debug info and get away with it. This is what I do in EC2 because I only have debug info on one server, not on all our cloud instances. And so I just use my one debug info server and I literally copy and paste the mouse and then dump it on other instances I'm instrumenting. Visualizations, you, I mean, I've got a blog post where I turned perf output into heat maps for block IO latency, and there's a lot more to perf. So perf is a really big topic, and I've just had time to cover one, really one of them, which is CPU profiling and some gotchas. So I've got lots of references, and these slides will be online, and in, including the references is my perf page, which has lots of one-liners get loaded. So my perf examples. Way too many one-liners, but um, it's a good way to browse through perf and, under, and figure out some functionality. So I should end there. And maybe you have time for one or two questions. Yes. Do we have the box? Yep. Uh, how does uh, GCC optimizations play with or does it create problems for you if you use very high levels of optimization? Um, how did you, well, GCC, but quite often, it is using the minus F emit, uh, it's using a MIT frame pointer. 
And so that breaks frame pointer based stack walking. With perf, I can use a different stack walking technique. So I can use uh, dwarf, the lib unwind stuff if it's there, uh, dwarf. I can use last branch record, which, which does work and should always work. But um, frame pointer is, this, is the basic one. And I try to get that to work on all my instances. So yeah, GCC optimizations interfere. And, but there uh, are ways around it. There are ways around it. So if you've got an instance and you're looking at libraries and you don't see stack traces, then often there's a debug symbol package you can install which has the debug info. So perf can then walk the stack traces without frame pointers. Uh, or you can use the, L, like the LBR walker. So perf record minus, minus call graph. So there's, there's ways around it. Thanks. So down here. Oh, good throw. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so with 414, we're actually trying to deprecate both uh, frame pointers and dwarf unwinders within the kernel for this orc thing. Is that affecting the way you get your perf traces now? Or more importantly, could you actually use the orc stuff for Java and things? <laughs> that stuff terrifies me. Like, I like having stack traces. I like them to work. But it's a good point. With the 414, the the new orc stuff, it's... Um, well, orc isn't about... It's, it's supposed to give us a better stack trace. We've never successfully got a dwarf unwinder to work in the kernel, which is why we're going to the orc thing. Right, so, I mean, it should be a, be a better thing, and we do get a little bit of performance back. Um, I'm not sure we're going to get that... Because I've done frame pointer testing, and maybe it's like 1% or so. Um, but... We'll, I mean, what, what's really going to happen is when will canonical push builds with uh, frame point is disabled and you've only got orc unwinding. And when that happens, we'll just have to deal with it and then uh, have perf use the orc stuff for the kernel stack traces. As for runtimes like Java, it would be interesting because, I, because most of our workloads, the frame pointer cost is like less than 1%. We have one workload where the stack depth gets to 1,000 frames and all the time. So we're going up and down 1,000 frames. And the frame pointer cost is 10%. So we can't run that in production with the enabled frame pointer. So a different stack walker may help for that microservice. And it's a very important microservice. And so we currently run a pool of instances, and then we run a few flame graph instances that just have the frame pointer enabled. And that's pretty annoying. So a, a Java orc unwinder might give us another way to tackle that. That'd be interesting. Um, you talk about the Intel events uh, usage in Perf. Uh, can you uh, even use hardware counters uh, in Perf so that you can know your bandwidth usage, your cache trashing, and so on? Like you could use Perf and drop VTune, for instance. Yeah, sorry, I, I can use perf and use v, vtune. What was the question? What was the question part of that? Well, the question is, can perf replace totally vtune, or is there still usage for vtune? Because in my case, I was using vtune for checking bandwidth, uh, cache usage, and so on, to see whether I was hitting the memory wall, and so on, and so on. Okay. Can perf help on this? If anyone hears from Intel, then they'll say, well, you can't replace VTN. VTN is awesome. I mean, VTN is helpful in that it has lots of rule sets. And so understanding the... P you think you can understand PMCs, but you talk to some Intel engineers and they say, no, no, no. These PMCs are actually quite complicated to figure out what's happening on the ports and the buses. So VTN does do a lot of that work that's really, really useful. I've not seen another tool do all the work in interpreting the PMCs properly with the exception of Andy Clean's PMC tools, which is on GitHub. Anyone use PMC tools from Andy Clean? So he's got a bunch of shell scripts, and, and he implements some of the rules that are like VTune, uh, but it's open source, and you can hack on it. But I've used VTune. VTune's pretty good. Um, I've also written my own... I mean, I've written my own perf tools where I'm just using PMCs directly. So for basic things like IPC, you don't uh, instructions per cycle, you don't need VTune. But if you want to get into low-level stuff, then it's handy. Okay, last question from Stephen. 
Hello? Yeah, per, perf should be able to handle, uh, if the kernel's doing ORC, not doing frame pointers, and uh, user space is doing frame pointers, perf does handle both, correct? Do you know or have you tried that? I haven't, I haven't tried that. Uh, at the moment, perf, you run it mi with minus call graph and you tell it what type of... Oh, it is. What type of walker to use? Does it? Does it? Does anyone know if it works with mixed uh, walkers? So if you've got frame pointers here and dwarf here, does it handle? It should. I mean, it should. But also, yes, it should handle both. Thanks. Yeah, and I also, I just want to make one little point that the stack walker has gotten so much better that last yesterday I tried out the uh, func stack trace with all functions on a virtual machine, and it didn't lock up my box. So actually, it's safe now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. All right, thank you very much.